I'm Dr. Alan Blum, director of the University of Alabama Center for the Study of Tobacco and Society. Welcome to Silk Cut, Surrealism as Subversion. In the 1990s, while collecting items for the center on Philip Morris, the world's leading tobacco company, I met Chuck of RQ, a leading collector of Little Johnny memorabilia, and formerly one of 16 regional sales managers for Philip Morris. He told me that when Congress banned cigarette ads from TV effective January 2nd, 1971, the day after the New Year's Day college football bowl games, the company's cigarette sales managers throughout the country saw this as the beginning of the end. Marlboro had been on a roll, the fastest growing cigarette brand in the U.S., thanks to its sponsorship of popular TV shows such as Route 66, Dobie Gillis, and the National Football League telecasts. But then the message came down from headquarters not to worry. We've got the situation, the strategy, and the plan well in hand. The fact is, cigarette ads never went off the air. For as soon as the overt TV commercials were no longer permitted, various national sporting events began being televised with cigarette brand names as the title sponsors. Winston Cup National, uh, Stock Car Racing, uh, or NASCAR, the Virginia Slims Women's Tennis Circuit, the Marlboro Cup Thoroughbred Horse Race, the Marlboro Grand Prix IndyCar Race, at a fraction of the cost compared to the overt cigarette commercials. Ads for Philip Morris's Marlboro and R.J. Reynolds' Winston cigarette brands were displayed on billboards at key camera angles in sporting events and in virtually every Major League Baseball stadium and football stadium. By 1989, a single Marlboro Grand Prix auto race could contain over 5,000 visual and verbal mentions of Marlboro in a single 90-minute telecast, or more than 50% of the actual viewing time. Meanwhile, the United Kingdom had banned cigarette TV commercials in 1965. This set off a torrent of creative activity to circumvent the spirit and intent of the law, none more clever than for the brand Silk Cut introduced by Gallagher in 1964 as a supposedly safer product with supposedly reduced levels of, or cuts, in the amount of tar or poisons. Commercials were still permitted in movie theaters, though, and silk-cut commercials were the most over-the-top of all. But as further restrictions against cigarette advertising were introduced, such as the ban on depictions of athletes or vigorous people of any kind, than on any people at all, Silk Cut's ad agency, Saatchi & Saatchi, created the most avant-garde of advertising campaign ever. The introduction of visual puns on the brand name, Silk Cut, inspired by the artist Lucio Fontana, several of whose paintings were acquired by Charles Saatchi, the head of the advertising agency, really made the difference. According to the ad agency's creative director, Paul Arden, Saatchi showed him some of Fontana's slashed canvases and punctured metal sculptures and said, here's the next campaign for Silk Cut. By the early 1990s, Silk Cut had become the best-selling cigarette brand in the United Kingdom. In September 1991, I was invited to give the main presentation on smoking at an international conference called Look After Your Heart, hosted by the British Health Education Authority and the Department of Health in London. While there, I was having lunch with one of my former medical students and family practice residents, Mavis Jaworski, when she told me, you've got to see these great anti-smoking ads all over London. Really? I said, I I hadn't heard about any such campaign at the conference. What she pointed out as we walked around the city were billboards featuring a swath of purple silk with a pair of scissors slicing through the fabric, beneath which were captions reading, smoking causes cancer. Smoking causes heart disease. Smoking causes fatal diseases. I asked her why she thought these were anti-smoking ads. She said, well, the ads are saying that, that scissors cut through cloth, just like cigarette smoking can cut your life, right? From her American eyes, and unlike every British school child, she had no idea that these were cigarette ads for a brand called Silk Cut. I don't think any more brilliant ads have ever been created. They were attractive, sensuous, and at first puzzling visual riddles. One even featured a translucent purple silk curtain with a silhouette of a shower behind it, a nod to the shower curtain slashing murder scene of Janet Leigh in Alfred Hitchcock's movie Psycho. Gallagher's Benson and Hedges brand campaign in the 1980s and 1990s also featured surrealistic keep-em-guessing images. Often the results were hilarious, like the image of the giant tomb of Ramses featuring the king on his throne. The only color in the ad is the blue of Benson and Hedges' lights, on the toilet paper roll inserted next to the throne. Other cigarette makers imitated the Silk Cut and Benson and Hedges campaigns. Philip Morris's Marlboro featured isolated desert 
Western scenes, one of which was of a sunset in the shape of the Marlboro Pack Chevron. And when cigarette ads were banned in 1992 in France, the Leo Burnett Advertising Agency for Philip Morris's Marlboro cigarettes created one of the most extraordinary ads ever for the French magazine VSD. It shows two images, one with a fence with a sign saying Défense d'Affichet or Post No Bills, where the Marlboro man had stood in the other image. The caption reads, advertising doesn't serve only to make brands come alive and grow. Sometimes these brands become myths that, whatever happens, live forever. In the U.S., arguably the most brilliant cigarette ad of all time was for R.J. Reynolds' Camel brand. No, not Joe Camel, but rather Tony the Trial Lawyer. For at the height of litigation against the tobacco industry in the late 1990s, Reynolds created the figure of a scuzzy plaintiff lawyer with a briefcase full of cash, living the high life. In your face, Reynolds seemed to be saying, perhaps this is one reason the cigarette industry has survived and prospered, a sense of humor.